metaphors and examples to help you kind of connect with a, a, with a, with a different worldview than was held by anyone you've ever met, including yourself, right? Uh, as much as we work on understanding all of life under all of Christ's lordship uh, in light of the word of God, nonetheless, this is the air we breathe. It's the, it's the frame in which we have grown to maturity, and so we have to take pains to say, what would that world be like? So I want to take one more run at this, and uh, if you'll do it, grab a hymnal and turn to page 43. One of the greatest um, English hymns written at least in the 19th century, maybe more, but at least in the 19th century. This is my father's world. Uh, this is a more enchanted faith. This is a, this is a product of a more enchanted view of the world. It, again, it was written in the 19th century, so it's not like this is you know, the, the product of something from 1412. Um, but nonetheless, it harkens back to that, that world that, that has been largely lost and that we need to recover. And so just read it with me as I go through this. This is my father's world. So the framing is that this is not a world of random materialist causes that have no meaning, but that it is not just a world under the sovereign control of a deity, but a deity who has presented himself as a father. And to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. You remember the medievals thought that the cosmos uh, was largely like a coordinated ballet. Uh, beautiful movement happening according to God's glorious design. Uh, that they would have told you that you can even hear this, this music of the spheres, uh, if you could somehow be disconnected from life on earth for a little while. We've been hearing it our whole lives, and therefore it, we've kind of blocked it out, but nonetheless, all of creation was literally singing the glory of God. So this is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hands the wonders wrought. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise. Again, here is nature in doxology. Nature, not in, uh, red in, tr in tooth and claw, although that is true in a fallen world. But this is nature actively engaged in glorifying its creator. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. It's a good song to have in your heart. And so I, I do feel a fear. I feel a fear that when I use the language of re-enchantment, to think of a world that is enchanted, you hear the language of empty sentimentality. You hear the language of hippy-dippy nonsense, right? You hear the language of um, the artistic soul who arbitrarily decides to see things from a magical prism. It's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that this is how God understands his world. And we have become colorblind. And we have become tone deaf. And we have become retarded in our ability to understand and appreciate and grasp the world as it is. And one of the things the word of God is doing is bringing us out of that darkness, increasing our capacity, enlightening us afresh. And we want to lean into that. And so with that in mind, think about how contrary uh, this text is. And this will be just a bit of review because we have a lot of ground to cover today. But think about how contrary this text is to a disenchanted world. Uh, the first thing I set before you from it is that Jesus in his conduct here uh, by taking the role of a uh, servant, uh, taking the role of the lowest possible servant, doing the most disgusting work that can be done. Um, if you're not familiar, this is the kind of service that uh, even Jewish slaves could not be asked to do. It was seen as too disgusting. We would equate this to cleaning someone's backside. It would be the lowest possible uh, offering of service that someone could offer and here's Jesus the Lord of all the king of glory uh, who stoops to do this most menial of tasks you can understand why Peter objects now 
It's crazy. You don't look at someone you've confessed as Lord and say no. That's a good lesson that Peter should have learned. It's a good lesson for us today to learn. But nonetheless, Peter does it because he knows what a disgusting task Jesus has taken up. But what is happening there, according to the word of God, is that Jesus is self-conscious that he has all authority. And the hour is upon him. This is Jesus. Um, you know, this is still veiled here. He's still, his glory is still veiled. But Jesus is aware of what reality really is. He knows that he um, not only has, by nature of his divinity, absolute control over all things he wishes to exercise control over, but because of his faithful service to the Father, the Father is giving him lordship over all things. This is Jesus attaining the name that is above all names because he is the ultimate faithful servant son of the Father. And what does he do as he takes, um, as, he, as, he, as he self-consciously moves into that vocational status? He takes the posture of a servant. And so what this tells us is the love that Jesus has shown to his own, that he has shown to the uttermost, is first meaningful. Love is not merely a word that we apply to the appetites of our flesh. Love is not a sentimental concept that we apply on the basis of who we think is nice to us or who we want to be nice back. Love is not, you know, as some of the materialists will tell you, love is not the byproduct of evolutionary forces that uh, it, it's, it's supposed to make you feel like something is significant so that you will pass your genes on into coming generations. No, love is something that is a reflection of who your creator is. And so it is meaningful. It's not random, chaotic nonsense. It's meaningful. And it can be made manifest. It can be made visible. It can have an impact on the world through actions like Christ who holds all authority taking the posture of a servant. We've talked about how servant leadership is a concept in the church, and it's a good one, but often servant leadership gets reduced down to just do whatever the other person wants done. That's not the kind of servant leadership that Christ models for us, right? He knows what Peter needs. He is absolutely going to provide what Peter needs. Peter's objections are not in any way something that Jesus reacts to. Jesus knows how to answer them, and he knows how to press on towards what is needful. He's not reacting to Peter. Peter is reacting to him, and Jesus never moves off target. And so we see the way that love is made manifest legitimately through what we would call appropriately servant leadership. But the servant and the leadership are in concert in such a way that it's not reducible to just be nice. It's to go after something good that profits the person being loved as you lead them toward a better place. So Jesus, you know, it, it, may, not, it may not grab you the way that I'm hoping it will, but what this is telling us is that a man in a servant's garb with a bowl and a towel is revealing cosmic reality to us and how we should conduct ourselves in light of it. But I mentioned there's sort of a sinister version of this that comes up as well there, right? Look at verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, and then we know the story as it goes from there. But here's the second point for those of you who have been keeping notes over the week. If we think about this re-enchanted world that is presented to us in this text where God shows, Christ shows what love to the uttermost looks like. Uh, the second point I would have you see clearly is that dark supernatural forces are a real and active part of the world. Dark supernatural forces are a real and active part of the world. I think evangelicals, particularly those who want to have a life of the mind, who want to be thinking Christians, I think in some ways materialism has pushed on us where we're kind of embarrassed to admit we believe devils and demons exist. We've had that nutty coworker who's like, you know what, I was really running late and uh, I had to get something done and the devil took my parking spot. 
or the devil causes the light to turn red, and we're like, yeah, come on, man, we're not going to do that. It, it has pushed us to a point of embarrassment to admit that we believe the world is composed of elements as God has revealed in his word. Are they still in parking lots? Are they flipping traffic lights? I don't know about that. But here, they're putting hearts, excuse me, thoughts into hearts. They're lighting up betrayal. There's a devil doing it. So again, I just want to make this point. Our materialist age rejects the idea that anything other than the merely human, and that is understood through the secular definition, has any impact on an individual. Our consensus is that my desires, my instincts, are provided by evolutionary forces through things like hormones and the friction created by bumping into other merely material, self-interested humans explains all that happens in life. But Scripture does not agree. Scripture tells us first that wickedness arises from rebellious nature. Wickedness arises from our rebellious nature. And it is spurred on by satanic temptation. So think about James chapter 1, 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. There's a, a considerable number of scholars who agree, and I find them very credible, that James has the scene of the garden in mind when he describes this process. That sin arises, yes, even in temptation, sin arises from inward uh, desire. That that desire moves towards active rebellion. And when we participate in active rebellion, the good judgment on our rebellion is the wages of sin. It's death. So you might ask then, how did the devil put into the heart of Judas, to use the language of the text, to betray Christ? I think probably we might follow what we understand to be James's lead, and we might look back to Genesis chapter 3 for some sense of this. You know chapter 1, excuse me, verse 1 of that text probably. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? A thought went into Eve's heart from a forked tongue. And when that had uh, grown into active sin, death was the consequence. I, 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 I want to read to you a section from uh, a text that I believe Hampton Keithley wrote, although I couldn't quite track it down for sure that it was him. He says, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 speaks of the flaming arrows sent by the wicked one, Satan. And this may simply refer to the varied external temptations and testings by which he seeks to control or influence our minds through what we see, read, and hear, right? And so where the Bible calls him the God of this world, the prince of the spirit of the air, um, there, there's some sense in which Satan has influence on the world as we run into it and, you know, you... You don't have to turn on the TV or open up your browser to know we live in a hyper-sexualized world. For one example, Christy and I were riding to church today, pulling up to a stop sign. There, were, uh, there was a car in front of us with some, some extravagantly vulgar bumper stickers on the back. Um, that is something of what we have in mind. We think about flaming arrows and external temptations just in the nature of the world as we experience it. The author goes on, due to his great power and cunning, however, it could possibly go beyond this. We all wonder at times just where some of our thoughts come from. And it may be that if we're not focused on the Lord and his truth as we should be, Satan, through his demon host, can somehow raise thoughts and questions in their mind. Uh, he points to John chapter 13, verse 2, as possibly supporting this. <clears throat> Though he says, and rightly so, that we aren't told just how the devil put it into Judas's heart to betray the Savior. This could simply refer to the culmination of the processes of external temptation that affected Judas' own thinking because of his failure to respond and truly believe in Christ. Later in verse 27, we are told that Satan entered Judas. But this was after the statement of 13, verse 2. How does he do it? External? Possibly in some supernatural mechanism. But the thing we must do to, to kind of recover the world, a sense of the world as it is is to remember that he does do this. It's ultimately 
our own culpability for our sin, our desires, our lusts, our active rebellion, but there is a satanic, supernatural, invisible component that must be accounted for. And it's interesting, some of you and I have talked about this uh, one-on-one, but Scripture never approaches what we would call the occult, the uh, dark magic, the, um, the satanic. It never approaches that as a materialist. Right, you, you you may have grown up and, and and with good reason been told you know you don't go to a truth uh, excuse me don't go to a uh, a palm reader or a psychic that's just made up nonsense they read people they know how to tell you what you want to hear and of course that's there's a there's an element of truth to that but that is never why scripture says to not engage with the occult scripture says to stay away from the occult because it's dangerous. And we need to note that. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations which you are about to dispossess. Listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. You say, well, Jeff, it could be because he knows it's bunkum and it's a way for people to be manipulated. That's fine. Let's fast forward to Acts chapter 16. Uh, Verses 16 through 19, as, well, you know, what does it mean to listen to diviners and fortune tellers as God condemns in Deuteronomy? Well, Luke there, in one of the uh, scenes he records that he participated in, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days, Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Scripture doesn't think this is all reducible to stage magic. Acts chapter 19. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. And their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled and many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. It's not, it's not um, immediate in the text. The text doesn't like force you to draw this conclusion. But notice, demonic activity caused people to get rid of their magic texts. When Jesus came in conflict with the demonic and that became known, people thought the right response to that is to get rid of this magical occult stuff we have. It's worth noting. And so this is the kind of stuff that Protestants just don't talk about. You've seen the scary movies probably, most of you. You know that if there's some kind of demon in the horror movie, some Catholic priest is showing up with some kind of elaborate ritual and they have this high holy spiritual throwdown. Protestants don't talk about this. But we, you know, I've, I've been in ministry for, since I was 20, so 20 years. I've been in, I've been in ministry for 20 years. And one of the most um, common questions I get from Protestants 
particularly Protestant students, is what's the deal with that devil stuff? And so I think we should talk about this more. In the text, the Word of God gives us warrant to do so. How does someone later become, you know, how does someone become demon possessed? Because the Bible talks about it, right? It talks about this fortune teller and these people who had evil spirits within them. And Jesus' ministry was driving out devils in some part. How would that happen? Well, Scripture doesn't give an outright statement. But you notice Jesus, excuse me, Judas becomes entirely possessed by Satan by the end of this story. So I think we might look to Judas for insight. And so, friend, let me tell you what I think that process would look like according to Scripture. One, Judas nurtured unrepentant sin. Judas nurtured unrepentant sin. Don't be so foolish as to think you can do the same without exposing yourself to escalating spiritual destruction. John chapter 12, 4 through 7. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, saw the woman who had given the extravagant uh, gift of uh, perfume to wash the feet of Christ. And he says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? It's what we call weaponized compassion, right? It's the manipulator using the idea of caring for others to get his malicious ends. John says he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having put charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. He nurtured unrepentant sin. It was for financial gain that Judas agreed to betray Christ. Outwardly or inwardly, Satan understood the right fiery dart to shoot at Judas uh, and to aid Judas' corruption was financial incentive. Matthew 26, verse 14, Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought to, an opportunity to betray him. So, Jesus, you know, the first step here is that Judas nurtured unrepentant sin. It's the first thing we know. Two, Judas gave himself to satanic ends. Now, this is where I don't know if it's self-consciously or if it's inadvertently, but this one who was nurturing unrepentant sin ended up working in direct concert as a parallel action to what Satan wanted done. Luke 22, starting in verse 3, Satan entered in Judas called Iscariot, who was a number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. We have in John's gospel a more strict chronology. Luke gives the broad summary. Luke has him working in uh, the thrall of Satan from the moment before he goes. Why is that? Because Luke's saying this was ultimately Satan's design. And John, giving us these details, says, oh, Judas was participating in this before he was actually uh, dispossessed of his personality and, and possessed by Satan. He gave himself to satanic ends, and that increased the likelihood that he would be possessed. Let me read to you from John MacArthur for a moment. The Bible does not reveal when and where Judas first met Jesus. He may have been among the Judeans who flocked to hear John the Baptist bear witness to Christ, or he may first have met the Lord at the beginning of his ministry when Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there Jesus was spending time with him and baptizing. When the Lord first called Judas to follow him, that's not, you know, likewise, that's not recorded in Scripture. With the other eleven, he was named as an apostle by Jesus after the Lord had spent a night in prayer. Luke chapter 6, at that point, if he had not already done so, Judas left his former occupation and became a full-time follower of Christ. He even stayed with him when many other false disciples abandoned him, as we see in John chapter 6. But though Judas closely accompanied Jesus, he never gave him his soul. So since, Jesus, uh, excuse me, since Judas was obviously not attracted to Christ on a spiritual level, why did he follow him? On the one hand, Judas, like many of his fellow Jews, fervently hoped that Jesus would overthrow the Romans and restore Israel's political sovereignty. But Judas was also motivated by greed, the desire for power and worldly ambition. As one of the inner circle of Jesus' followers, he no doubt hoped for an important position in the restored kingdom, as did the other disciples. You've seen that in Matthew chapter 20. Judas was not interested in the kingdom for salvation's sake, but for what he hoped to get out of it, namely wealth and power and prestige. And as time went on, Judas uh, 
possibly became increasingly disillusioned. Jesus showed no signs of becoming the conquering political and military Messiah that Judas fervently hoped for. In fact, Christ had rebuffed the people's attempt to make him king. The Lord stressed the spiritual dimension of the kingdom, while Judas eagerly anticipated an earthly, political, and economic one. But he hid his growing disenchantment behind a facade of hypocrisy just a few days before the Last Supper. However, an incident occurred that apparently was the last straw for Judas. At a dinner in Bethany given in Jesus' honor, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anointed Jesus with a large amount of expensive perfume. Shocked and outraged, Judas protested indignantly. Judas, of course, cared nothing for the poor. He was a thief. Losing out on the opportunity to embezzle from the vast sum of money, which you know we talked about at the time, that's a full year's wages for an ab, uh, average laborer. So convinced uh, was he in his uh, so convincing was he in his outward display of pious hypocrisy, though, that the rest of the disciples joined in their protest. Judas's simmering discontent content then boiling over. He immediately after this incident went to the chief priests and said, "What are you willing to give me to betray him to, to betray him to you?" And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus, and that came down to telling the leaders where he could be at the, where he could be found at night away from the crowds. Judas could no longer contain his bitterness and disillusionment, which spilled forth in secret treachery. That's a good summary. I think we have a warrant from that scriptural data to say he was nurturing unrepentant sin and he gave himself at least in parallel to satanic designs and so third eventually the process of nurturing sin and walking in pattern with satan's ends arrives at a point where one pers- where one's personality is displaced as the controlling intelligence activating the body again catholics talk about this more and i'm 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 loath to sort of endorse their whole formula, but they they have a um, they have sort of a, a pattern of escalation. They talk about demonic infestation that moves to either what they call oppression or uh, victimization, and that moves on to possession. And the application I would make for you here is, you know, as thoughtful Christians who want to be found faithful in this age, or if you're someone who's nurturing secret sin and giving yourselves a pattern of lifestyles that are contrary to Christ's commands. You need to know that as Western culture continues to degrade, we are seeing a revival of paganism. I was talking to the Nulls last night about this phenomenon on TikTok called Witch Talk, where these people are self-consciously seeking to become the avatars of pagan deities. And this new paganism is as demonic as was ever seen in some sacred grove where an innocent was to be sacrificed. But it's also one that has been hardened against the claims of Christ. Initial paganism never knew what hit them with Christ, when Christ and the gospel showed up. This paganism thinks it has found Christ wanting and has went to seek the demonic afresh. And so I think we should expect that the renewed practice of occultism through New Age spirituality, witchcraft, and listen, the naive assumptions about the the neutrality of technology, we can talk about that more, it's going to lead to an increase in overtly demonic activity, and the church, broadly speaking, will have a ministry to offer those who foolishly presented themselves to dark spiritual forces after rejecting Christ. Friend, if you're here and you don't know him, that may be you. Foolishly presenting yourself in a way that Scripture forbids because of the real danger it represents. Your only hope is to run to Christ the same way that all of us in this room who have found life in His name, that's our only hope as well. It's to agree with the Father about who the Son is, to ask for His forgiveness and find just how powerful His grace is to you. You should do that immediately, not primarily because of the danger, but primarily because you will get to know Christ who is the source of all joy. But it's a strong secondary motivation. It's your only hope against these dark forces. I would remind you, too, that the increasing use of pharmaceuticals is a major avenue of opportunity for these dark spiritual forces we're talking about. You know Galatians chapter 5, you may remember when I preached through it, 20 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Sounds like a New Year's Eve party. 
I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And, and the thing we have to note is that the word translated sorcery in our text is pharmakeia, which is the source of our English word pharmacy and pharmaceutical. In Paul's day, the, world, the word primarily meant dealing in poison or drug use and was applied to divination and spell casting because sorcerers often used drugs along with their incantations and amulets to, to conjure occult power. Think about the Oracle of Delphi. This is from the New York Times in 2002. The Oracle of Delphi uh, started operating before 1200 years B.C. It was considered the most sanct uh, sacred sanctuary for the ancient Greeks. They considered that the, the temple there where the Oracle of Delphi was housed to be the center of the world, marking the site with a large canonical stone, which means, uh, they call it the omphalos, which means navel or center. And so for 12 centuries, the oracle at Delphi spoke on behalf of the gods, advising rulers, citizens, and philosophers on everything from the most intimate details of their private lives, according to their own memoirs, to affairs of state. The oracle was always a woman, her divine utterances made in response to a petitioner's request. In a trance, at times in a frenzy, she would answer questions, give orders, and make prophecies. Where the, the temple was built was originally a, shi a shrine to Gaia, the earth goddess, the temple of Delphi, by the 8th century, was dedicated to Apollo, the god of prophecy, and his oracle spoke out, often deliriously, and exerted wide influence. One of her admired pronouncements named Socrates, the wisest of men. Before a prophetic session, the oracle would descend into a basement cell and breathe in the sacred fumes. Some scholars say her divine communications were then interpreted and written down by male priests, Often an ambiguous verse, but others say the oracle communicated directly with petitioners. In a very real sense, the oracle of Delphi went down into a basement filled with mind-altering fumes, got high, and came back out and gave prophecies that people said, you couldn't have known that apart from supernatural forces. Now, with the rise of Christianity, the temple decay decayed. The Roman emperor, Julian the Apostate, tried to restore it in the 4th century, but the oracle wailed that her powers had vanished. The gospel came. Jesus kicked the false gods out. Her power vanished. But don't lose the sense that what activated was pharmakeia. The use of mind-altering substances was so associated with occult and sorcerous practices in the first century world that the equivalent of our word drugs could be used as a reference to sorcery. The reality is that Paul had something like magic and drugs in mind when he wrote under the Spirit's inspiration Galatians 5. And that means we have to broaden our understanding of how this text applies in our day. Modern society is becoming more and more accommodating to the recreational use of mind-altering substances, not only alcohol or marijuana or street-level hallucinogens. What is most fashionable among um, uh, elites in the entertainment industry is uh, DMT con consumption, dimethyltryptamine via um, a, a plant called ayahuasca. And through this, there's this trend emerging that has major spiritual consequences. Consequences even beyond the readily apparent issues of dependency, physical and mental health, and the effects on a family or a community. We have to consider the supernatural spiritual consequences of mind-altering substances. Uh, Megan Fox, you, you may have noticed, uh, traveled down to, I think, LeBron James' favorite place in the Amazon to take ayahuasca. There she talks about a ritual where she consumed the blood of her boyfriend under the influence of this drug. We might dismiss this as hallucination. And I don't know that it's, you know, in some places not merely hallucination. But we should also countenance the possibility that like the Oracle of Delphi, these users are participating in a sorcerous encounter with what is ultimately demonic intelligence. Secondly, we should consider that mind-altering medicines are also possibly, not always, I want to be real clear about that, not always, not necessarily but possibly detrimental. We treat everything, depression, ADHD, every bit of that we treat with mind-altering medicines. Prozac, I think, is the most subscribed substance. You know, <laughs> Joe might be able to tell me. Um, but I think that, at least recently, was the most prescribed substance in our society. You probably remember the story from uh, U.S. News 
from 2017 that uh, said a new study has found that human antidepressants are building up in uh, fish in waterways, particularly in the Great Lakes region, through the wastewater that is processed from human, uh, human waste. There is so much antidepressant being metabolized by the body that when it is flushed, processed through the water treatment plant that does not, is not set up to process and filter out these chemicals, it's going into water and <laughs> the brains of fish are showing major buildups of Zoloft, Prozac. This is happening among smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, bass uh, rudd, rock bass, white bass, white perch, walleye, bowfin, steelhead, and yellow perch fish in the Niagara River. These active ingredients from antidepressants, which are coming out from wastewater treatment plants, are accumulating in fish brains, said Diana Aga, Ph.D., the study's lead scientist, in a statement released by the University of Buffalo where the research were conducted. The fish are being exposed to these chemicals because of contamination of the river's water by wastewater from treatment plants. The plants generally focus on killing disease-causing bacteria and removing solid waste. However, antidepressants, which are found in the urine of people, are mostly overlooked and not removed from the wastewater, Dr. Aga said. Although the buildup of drugs in the fish doesn't pose any danger to humans, it could have serious impact on the environment. The antidepressants could alter the fish's feeding behavior and survival instinct, ultimately disrupting the delicate balance between species that help keep the ecosystem stable, says study co-author Randolph Singh, Ph.D. It might mess up how fish eat, so it's dangerous. No word about the fact it is so present in the human ecosystem that enough is left over to contaminate fish populations. This is the kind of insanity that our materialist approach to pharmaceuticals and the human being has left us in. So we should anticipate by either self-consciously remembering not to view the world uh, as a materialist, but rather to account appropriately for spiritual realities in our conversation, our analysis of events, our life and society, etc. And to be, or secondly, to talk about these things in such a way that they are not taboo within our church. We have to talk about these things. It has to be the kind of place where these things can be discussed if we're going to have a ministry to those who may be caught under, unawares. I'm going to start landing the ship here. Maybe the question that comes up after this is, okay, Jeff, you kind of laid out all those dangers, how that process might work. We're thinking about the dark supernatural world. How do we, you know, how do we protect ourselves against those things? What preventative measures can we take? And so what I would say to you, friends, is not talismans and not rituals, but the, the right uh, practice here to insulate ourselves against these things is what we might call spiritual hygiene. Uh, you, you know what it is to practice hygiene, is to clean yourself, right? And in, in cleaning yourself, you, you protect yourself against the kind of diseases that occur uh, when people do not take care of themselves. Well, here I would call this something like spiritual hygiene. Uh, hygiene. The first thing is to confess Christ as Lord. And friend, again, just to make the point as much as I can, if you're here and you are not confessing Christ as Lord, that is the burden that is upon you immediately. Not just because... It would protect you from spiritual forces, but because it brings you into uh, step with your creator and is the, the source of joy. It, it's the way that you will enter into the joy of Christ and that you will uh, find relief from your troubled conscience and that you will, be, uh, you will be saved in an eternal sense. So first, confess Christ as Lord. Second, Repent and confess your sin regularly and publicly as is appropriate. We need to be a repentant people. Third, fill your life with the things of Christ. His word, prayer, hymns, church fellowship. You say, well, Jeff, you mentioned all these pharmaceuticals that are prescribed. What do I do about that? Look, a, a Christian worldview from the Bible, Dr. Luke, Jesus' own ministry, says that medicinal needs exist. But what we can't do is run to a pharmaceutical solution without any countenance of other factors. Pharmaceuticals can't be for us a magic fix-all, despite they're being sold that way by a materialist society. We want to confess Christ as Lord. We're going to confess and repent of our sins. We're going to fill our lives with the things of Christ. And if difficulty remains, uh, we'll, we'll step beyond those 
and say, what else can the medicinal world offer us? And I want to make this point. If you run into anything on this front, please come see me or Mike or one of the elders of whatever congregation you're a member of. This is the kind of thing that for too long has been disconnected from spiritual counsel in terms of uh, Christian Protestant churches. We want Midway to be a different kind of place, particularly if we're right uh, and seeing that these things may reemerge with some vigor in our day. So I'll, I'll put the bow there. I'm going to call our musicians up. We're going to enjoy Christ, enjoy confessing Christ as Lord in the way we sing. We do live, as Luther wrote, in a world with devils filled. But we also live in a world, as Luther wrote, where one word from the mouth of Christ will slay them all. We are under the supernatural care of a great Lord, and he is worthy of our worship. And friend, if, you, if you've been provoked to respond to anything you've heard today, um, please come up front and talk to me. Otherwise, we need to worship Christ, who is our Savior, our relief, our protector, and the one who keeps us in the Father's care. Would you stand with us? Out of the deep I call To Thee, O Lord, to Thee Before Thy throne I fall Be merciful to me Out of the deep I cry, the woeful deep of sin. For evil days gone by, of evil now within. Be merciful to me be merciful to me through shadow dark and valley deep be merciful to me out of deep of fear and dread of coming pain all night till morning's near I plead the precious name the bird Mercy now and 
grace for every hour. My ransom soul rejoice, thy Savior comes with power. Be merciful to me. shadow dark and valley be merciful to me be merciful to me be merciful to me through shadow Church, you can be seated and we'll prepare to take the Lord's Supper. We know the answer to that prayer. The Lord is inclined to be merciful and the bread and the cup remind us of this. This is how he has been merciful. If you want to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that's where we'll take our instructions as we prepare.